From Radio Diaries, I'm Joe Richman, and this is the final episode of The Unmarked Graveyard, a series about people buried in America's largest public cemetery, the lives they lived, and the people they left behind. Hi, Fiji. There were thousands of questions. Where's his family? Where's his people? Neil Harris was last seen in Inwood, New York on December 12, 2014. The playwright, he was last novelist seen. and author of Happy Island, Miss Dawn Powell. Annette found you, she found us, and we're here. And now we know where you are. Back in 1995, Lamont Dotton was 21 years old and a freshman at Queens College when one evening he didn't come home. Within 48 hours, his mother was at a local police precinct trying to report him missing. His name was added to a pile of almost 20,000 cases that the NYPD's missing person squad was supposed to be investigating. And Lamont's case fell through the cracks. This is a story about the New York City Police Department and a woman's search to find out what happened to her son. It took me 30 days to get him officially reported missing. My name is Dr. Anita Fowler, and Lamont Dotton was my son who went missing in 1995. I remember walking in to the precinct. There was a full room of people scurrying around while I'm talking to a man who's being very nonchalant with me. Now, here I'm a mother trying to report my one and only child missing. And no matter what I said, he says, no, take my word for it. He'll be home soon, you know. He was considered an adult. There was a Hispanic lady listening, and she came over. She said, I'll take your uh, report. I'm not sure how far I can get it. And then I called at least twice a week at night because that's when they would work the shift for missing persons. One day turned into two days, and two days turned into three days, and unbelievably, months. What? definitely remember his mom being very persistent. My name's Cameron Brown. I was a detective in the missing persons department from 1997 to 2002. She would constantly call the missing persons. She wanted to know what was going on today, what was happening. But they would refuse to meet with me and just say there's no update or we have a new detective on it. The case kept opening and closing. <laughs> And one time I showed up and his picture wasn't even on the board. So I said, how are you searching for my son if his picture's not here? The missing person squad at that time was in a state of disrepair. There was no work being done on cases. Record keeping wasn't good. I'm Philip Mahoney. I was the commanding officer of the missing person squad in the New York City Police Department from 1998 to 2000. The amount of case law that each individual detective had there was amazing. This was 10, 11 detectives with between 20 and 40 cases apiece. And there was not a lot of investigation. They didn't have vehicles for us to actually go out and do the interviews. It was just mostly phone calls at that point. You know, hi, this is Detective Brown. You made a report on so-and-so missing. Did they come home? No, they didn't. Okay, thank you. I remember looking at this spreadsheet of open missing person cases. It just went on for like 100 pages. Someone with an adult missing son, that would be low on the totem pole. This article is from the Daily News, November 21st, 1995. Harlow's resident, Arnita Fowler, hadn't had time to prepare for Thanksgiving. She's been too busy checking city hospitals, the morgue, and jails in a desperate search for her 21-year-old son. I was known as a one-woman search party. I'm creating my own press conferences. I've learned how to write press releases on the fly. I would look in every homeless person's face as I walked the streets. I go, was that crazy? But I know that I could not live the rest of my life not knowing if he was out there. 
I was 17 when I had my son and everything I did evolved around him. He was a very loving, very loving son. He had that spirit of happiness with them, you know what I mean? Like carefree. We were always together. And I know he was saying, my mom's gonna find me. I became lieutenant and commanding officer of the missing person squad in 1998. Then I immediately tried to organize the missing person squad. And so we appointed a couple of people to go through that list, the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of active cases that had accumulated over the years, page by page, name by name, and find out what happened to these people that the missing person squad never followed up on. It felt good. I was actually out doing investigations and we had two or three cases from, you know, the fifties and when you really go back and still speak to parents, that same pain of their child being missing was still there. They would start with very basic checks, fingerprint checks, and so on. We did find a lot of people through routine checks. I spent four years looking for my son. And then this one particular night, I was so frustrated that I picked up the phone in frustration and called. And the same man who had been telling me no, it was the same guy. He said, sure, we'll meet you. And when they came, my house was full. And it was a lady officer. She said they had discovered that they hadn't dotted every I and crossed every T. Okay, so I'm reading from a missing persons report. The report says that the missing person was found floating in the river. October 1995, and after that... So apparently, so eight days after Lamont went missing, they found his body. The body would have been sent to the morgue. And the their morgue process requires them to submit fingerprints. To identify him through fingerprints, which could be difficult if they were in the water for a long time. And the FBI matched it with an arrest that was made. He was arrested for a stolen car when he was in high school. But the NYPD never followed up for results of the identification until 1999, four years later. On this date, the deceased was identified as Lamont Dotton through fingerprints. In view of the facts stated above, the undersigned recommends that this case be marked closed. I couldn't imagine that this is the outcome after four years. I don't know how he died. I do not believe it was suicide, and there was no blood force trauma, nothing indicating foul play. This is the paper that shows where my son was buried at in Hart Island. There's no name, it just says male. To bury my son in a place as though he had no one, as though he had no one, and I'm in your he was somebody's child. And it shows the date of death and the day he was exhumed four years later. I remember opening the paper and seeing the picture of the body and the horse drawn carriage going around Queens. I was like, wow, we had that case, look. And we're all looking at it. And I just can't imagine any of my children not coming home or not knowing what happened to him. This is uh, the Daily News, September Daily News, 21st, 1999. September 21st, 1999. Student laid to rest. Four years after being buried in a pompous grave, a missing Queens student was finally given a proper burial yesterday. And it was a perfect funeral. He was drawn by two horses in a, a carriage. And and the casket itself is all white, like the horses. It is where I believe that he deserved nothing but the best. I needed memories to be something that you could reflect on who he was, the prince that he was to me. So Lamont is now buried at the Calvinton National Cemetery. I just went there yesterday and put flowers. I just took pictures there. There are seasons of my feelings that shift. 
One major shift was when I realized he's been gone longer than he's been with me. But I can, as a mother, you know, still smell what he smelled like, still hear what he laughed like. And when I'm looking at his picture, I can imagine what he's actually sounding like. So it's just really, people just don't disappear. Following years of advocacy by Fowler, New York State passed a law in 2016 requiring the police to expedite searches for missing adults. It's called Lamont Dotton's Law. In recent years, advances in fingerprinting and DNA technology have improved the identification of unnamed bodies in New York City. This is the last episode in our series, The Unmarked Graveyard, Stories from Heart Island. The whole time we've been working on this series, Heart Island has been mostly off limits, as it has been for 150 years. But today, we are able to report that Heart Island is officially opening to the general public. Tours begin this week. When we first started thinking about this project, I kind of imagined it as a series of audio obituaries for people who never got one. But each story became more than that, more complicated, more mysterious, more surprising. In the end, this series isn't just about individuals buried on Heart Island. It's about the people who went looking for them and the people who remember them. Because once the body is gone, all that's left are the stories. Our story about Lamont Dotton was produced by Elisa Scarce. The producers behind our series, The Unmarked Graveyard, are Nellie Gillis, Micah Hazel, Elisa Scarce, and myself. All the stories were edited by Ben Shapiro and Deborah George. Our NPR editor was Matt Ozug. Sound mixing by Ben Shapiro and Mitra Kaboli. Marketing and development by Lena Engelstein. Theme music is by Matthias Bossi and Stellwagen Symphonette. Thanks to Melinda Hunt and the Heart Island Project. And thanks to our broadcast partner, NPR's All Things Considered. We're proud members of Radiotopia from PRX, a network of independent, creator-owned, listener-supported podcasts. You can hear them all at radiotopia.fm. Radio Diaries has support from the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Lily Auchincloss Foundation, New York City's Department of Cultural Affairs, and from listeners like you. I'm Joe Richmond of Radio Diaries. Thanks for listening.